Welcome. Welcome. Thank you all for coming on this Monday. Welcome to visitors to NBC. I see a lot of new faces today. That's great. Very happy to introduce this team of folks from all over the place. Uh, Lee Freilich is a researcher and director of the University of Minnesota's Center for Forest and Eco Center for Forest Ecology and a fellow at the Institute of the Environment. Our own Evan Roberts is a contract assistant professor in sociology. Um, Brian Roke is human environment geographer and GIS type, uh, and he's also a PhD student in geography. Kim Su Yu is associate professor in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate, and Dave Van Riper uh, is the director of the Spatial Analysis Corps at NPC. Um, they all get mugs um, like this because uh, they're all presented. I'm not. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're the thing. You're the, you're the, the floor is yours. How are you going to do this? Hi everyone. Thank you for being here today. So we're going to tag team this and. Uh, Kyung Su is going to start us off and then we'll kind of work in based upon who is kind of primary lead at, at the different points in the project. So Kyung Su, you can All right. start us off. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, initiate the, the talk by uh, saying a few words about Earthsomes. So this, this needs a little bit of background. So you know, we live in Minnesota and you know, this area used to be under uh, very thick ice until about 9,000 years ago. So when uh, ice was covering uh, Great Lakes region and New England and much of Canada, uh, the, the native earthworms were basically wiped out uh, by the glaciers. So after that, you know, climate warmed up and glacier retreated and forest and prairie uh, followed the glacier retreat. But earthworms, they are very uh, slow creature. So they move about you know, five to 10 meters per year. So if you multiply five to 10 meters by 10,000 years roughly, then you get 50 kilometers to 100 kilometers. So over the 10,000 years, if they are just allowed to disperse by themselves, they can very close uh, to in cities. So the consequence is that uh, most of the uh, forest and prairie in Great Lakes and New England and much part of the Canada basically evolved over the last 10,000 years without uh, native earthworms. But then the whole thing has changed uh, quite abruptly when Europeans began to arrive and that they wanted to you know, raise the crops they used to grow in Europe. So when they uh, bring the crops with their pots and those hot have soils that have earthworms and also cocoons. And also later, you know, uh, when you log the forest, and there's unpaved road, and your bulldozers and they bring the soils from the outside from the farms, and they also bring the earthworms. And much later, then when you go out uh, fishing, and you often buy earthworm base, and once you are done, you throw them out. You know, who cares? And so if you go out and sample the earthworms these days in Minnesota, and 100 out of 100 will be uh, European species. You're not going to find any uh, American species, or you're not going to find uh, an Asian species. But there are some reports of Asian species as well coming up in uh, Wisconsin too. So we are worried about this because uh, you know, even though we consider ourselves as a lowly creature, and I grew up in South Korea, and we have this problem that uh, and even Ursums resist when stepped on. So it kind of assumes that Ursums are lowly creature, but they do have enormous ecosystem effects. So here, you know, one example is, this is the Ursum, uh, pre, you know, pre Ursum invasion forest. You have quite green understory, and this is active invasion. And because Ursums, uh, they remove this little layer they basically uh, remove the surviving layer for those understory plants. And then they also uh, make huge changes in the soils that lead to uh, the cycles of nutrients in the forest. So they have, uh, they have been ex exerting a dramatic uh, impact on that threatens the sustainability of the forest uh, in this region. So as I mentioned, uh, no, there are several uh, sources of invasion. So, Ursums naturally disperse very slow. So they need us. They actually take advantage of us for their own dispersal. And we bring them to new environment through many of our activities without necessarily knowing what we are doing. 
So, and our sums, you know, they come using us, but then depending on where they land on, they have different impacts, and then the existing forest they can affect, uh, affect their uh, dispersal history. So, you know, Minnesota is a kind of interesting place because we have three different uh, biomes uh, from <coughs> you know, coniferous trees to deciduous trees and prairie. So you can begin to study how uh, those you know, vegetation types can you know, uh, control the humans, uh, this, you know, humans led dispersal of the earthworms. So when you think about human activities, you can think of you know, you know, two broad uh, different time scales. One is migration. And as you know, Minnesota opens up the Europeans and they began to arrive and through different uh, you know, pathways, one of them is uh, definitely expanding railroads. And then so at the smaller scale, and the humans, by changing their landscapes, they alter you know, how they manage the ecosystems and interface with un relatively undisturbed forest. So you know, depending on how we use the lands, we may have very different kinds of boundary between agriculture and forest and also the length of the boundaries. We may have very different uh, nature or length of the forest logging boundaries, and as well as uh, the forest and uh, lakes and the water bodies because they also uh, are used for our recreation activities. So if you think of ursums, kind of once they are you know, bring to the site uh, by humans, they can expand like a five to 10 meter per year. Then if you know this interface and the, when that interface was established, then you can begin to model how ursums are begin, you know, expanding into uh, the natural vegetations. So the question we have, which we you know, have been working on, we are not quite uh, into the uh, you know, answers yet, but we made a significant process. This. You know, those works have been driven by this uh, simple questions. So if similar cultural groups and cultural you know, populations settle in different uh, biomes, and here conifers, deciduous trees, and prairie, and how will they you know, behave differently, and how will they have adopted different land use mechanisms and the land use strategies such that their uh, you know, choice of the land use have longer term impact on the dispersal of the earthworms. So I think this is the turn that I need to make to... To be here, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> Being an expert on agriculture, um, <laughs> as you all know. Uh, so yeah, we sort of have identified, uh, sort of as Kyung Soo was saying, like these three potential uh, ways uh, in which uh, human uh, three. Uh, uh, primary potential ways in which humans might have brought earthworms uh, to these various uh, <coughs> parts of Minnesota and, and altered the environment. Uh, and we can get some kind of uh, assessment of how frequent uh, these activities were uh, out, of the, uh, out of the census and so we sort of structure um, our selection of uh, sites to sort of get at what people were doing uh, in these uh, in these different uh, in these different regions. Um, the census is sort of better at describing uh, agriculture. Uh, we know uh, very much that people were were, were farming. One of the challenges uh, with uh, with sort of logging is that it's mostly done in the winter, so it's a uh, it's a very seasonal activity, uh, and we think maybe sort of somewhat sometimes understated uh, in the. Um, population uh, census data. Uh, and then certainly recreation, which uh, <coughs> is going to be, uh, we think, a pretty important way in which earthworms are moved uh, sort of close to, close to water. People bring in their boats, uh, things like that. Uh, that is not going to leave many traces as a sort of a permanent occupational record uh, in the census. Because again, it's a very seasonal activity and the census was carried out uh, at, a, uh, at a different time. But we, we want to try and identify how these uh, places differ with respect uh, to, um, to, these, uh, to these activities. Um, and uh, in the future, as Kim Su said, uh, this is uh, <coughs> a sort of 
still at a fairly preliminary stage, we hope to go to other sources to identify like what was the extent of recreation uh, at the time of likely uh, earthworm uh, arrival. Um, and, and so our challenge is really sort of although we know that earthworms move very slowly, um, identifying when and where. We can sort of bound this um, by <coughs> uh, knowing when people arrived, but we can't get a sort of precise uh, estimate. Uh, so we take uh, <coughs> an approach as we're sort of thinking about this, uh, which was inspired by uh, what Myron Gutman uh, and others have done uh, in, in Kansas uh, with their study of the... Uh, uh, of the Great Plains, um, and they took a sort of a place-centered approach where they uh, selected uh, different ta uh, different townships across Kansas, and we're sort of aiming to, in a sense, replicate uh, that approach. So what we're describing here uh, is not the sort of 25 townships that Gutman et al. Uh, did with their Great Plains study. We're d we've selected three uh, as a pilot study to sort of see how, how well uh, this approach uh, works. Uh, one of the hypotheses um, that we started out with was that uh, Swedish immigrants, and we don't want to damn the Swedes, they're lovely people, uh, may have been a potentially sort of important uh, source of how earthworms were transmitted. We have very good data on uh, the Swedes uh, back in Sweden uh, as well, um, and so we can potentially look um, <coughs> eventually at where did the Swedes who are living in these particular places come from, if we can find them uh, in the in the Swedish uh, censuses. Um, so one of the criteria we used to select our places, it was a sort of um, multi-stage uh, uh, decision uh, to select, uh, <coughs> select, select these townships, was were there a lot of Swedish people uh, living in there? And so we were looking for townships across these three different eco-regions, which all had a significant uh, Swedish population, uh, a minimum of 20%, of uh, if I uh, remember uh, rightly. Uh, so the Swedes, um, you know, there's some sort of data reasons uh, to study them, um, but they are an interesting group also because they are coming from a sort of a similar similar climate. Um, this is, <laughs> um, what is the book this is out of, Brian? Uh, I can't remember the title off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Anyway, uh, I think you can sort of see um, this depiction here. Uh, the Swedes were enticed uh, to the United States by uh, this vision uh, of it having palm trees and being particularly uh, fertile <laughs> soil and being uh, a lovely, uh, a lovely climate. Um, and they discovered uh, that. Palm trees don't really grow in Minnesota, uh, but it was a familiar climate and sort of familiar. Um, uh, familiar forms of, of, of landscape uh, for them, and so uh, Swedes uh, <coughs> mostly uh, came to, uh, to 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 the to the northern uh, states. The Swedish immigration uh, was sort of heavily centered on going to the United States in the last couple of decades uh, of the um, 19th century and into the uh, into the into the 20th century uh, so it's a very concentrated migration and as I think everyone everyone knows uh, a lot of them uh, end up in Minnesota um, <coughs> but um, and yeah, 80% of the Swedes uh, who left Sweden uh, in this era came to the United States. Very similar, um, the, the Norwegians uh, are pretty similar in their sort of concentration uh, on, uh, on, on the United States as the, the destination uh, that, they, uh, that they went to. Uh, other European nationalities were a little more, uh, a little more dispersed. Um, so we look for look for sort of places with significant concentrations of Swedes across the three uh, <coughs> across the three eco regions uh, of uh, of Minnesota, um, and the townships uh, that we selected were sort of based on this population criteria uh, of having a significant number of Swedish people, greater than 20% of the population, uh, but also on some environmental criteria, and Brian yeah. is going to talk about that. And so part of what was happening is kind of weighing a trade-off between uh, what we what we can get from the data and what Kyung Soo and Lee knew from their extensive field experience. Because, you know, ultimately, it's nice for us to kind of mine the historic data, but, you know, they can actually go out and sample earthworms, you know, look at the genetic makeup of those earthworms, go to Sweden, look at the genetic makeup of those earthworms, and say, well, are they, do they seem like they're from the same population? And so we can go and ground truth this in the present day in order to, to make, to, as a validation step for things. 
And so some of the criteria that we were looking at was, first of all, obviously three townships, one for every biome. Uh, had to have greater than 20% Swedes in 1910. And so some of you will wonder, why, why 20%? And I'll, we'll, we'll admit it is a subjective number that was determined to be a, a significant pr uh, proportion of the population so that there would be a cultural influence and there would be an influence of folks bringing things from Sweden. Um, railroads had to be present in the township. Uh, there needed to be remnant forest or prairie in the present day. And so I'm sure it's not a surprise to many of you, there's not actually a lot of remnant forest and prairie around anymore. And so that severely limited um, the number of townships that we could, uh, that, that we could actually select. Um, and then finally, there needed to be lakes or water bodies, somewhere where you know, it's, it was reasonable to assume that there could be some fishing. Um, and then finally, we relied a lot on expert knowledge. And so we went through the structured approach, kind of whittling down the number of townships. Um, and then ultimately, it came down to Kyungsoo and Lee saying, I've spent a lot of time in the field here. This is what I know about these sites. And we think it's reasonable that we would be able to you know, meet the other objectives of the research process. And so just as a quick refresher, what's a township? Uh, six miles by six miles uh, for the entire extent and then a one mile by one mile section. And so then these are, those would be further subdivided uh, into, into individual parcels of uh, 80 acres or 160 acres or 360 acres, depending on you know, what, how much was sold at the time uh, when it was sold. A lot of it uh, was passed out to railroads, which was then resold to settlers. Um, and so a lot of the Swedes that we're looking at because of the time period, um, they probably purchased the land after somebody else had settled it or owned it previously. Um, Cochran, who was uh, an economist over in St. Paul, liked to say that everyone was a speculator at the time. And so um, I think we're, we're uh, working in that kind of an environment. So we'll kind of go through each of these townships and just kind of get you know, a, a picture of what do they look like today uh, and what's the, what's the current land use look like. And so here is uh, Kenosha. And so Kenosha is in, uh, is, is in northeast Minnesota. And it's primarily forest, uh, deciduous forest. And when you think about agricultural suitability, so my, my master's degree is in agronomy and plant genetics, and uh, we, talk about, we talk about heavy soil, or we talk about light soil, or we talk about thin soil. This would fall into the thin area, so you're very close to bedrock. And so you can think, you know, gardening here is going to be pretty difficult, um, and it's, it's also going to be really difficult. You think if you're clearing the land, you'd actually have to remove all these stumps, and that's a, that's a substantial uh, that, that's a, a substantial hardship. It's also very swampy. Um, and, but you can see here we have our lake present. Um, and uh, what we'll do now is we'll look at some of the other ones. So kind of keep this picture in the back of your mind. Now we're going to go to kind of more central Minnesota. So you can see here uh, is, uh, you, you can see here is uh, Borgholm. And the landscape patterning here looks quite different. So Compared to this, uh, you know, this looks kind of like a map. You know, I think that that's a fair aerial char characterization. Here it looks far more um, chopped up. Some of that is probably the timing of the, the photograph for sure, but it's also um, indicative of the land use that's going on. So you can see that these, the parcelization, um, some of that is a result of uh, the type of agriculture that's going on here, um, which is going to be different than southwest Minnesota. Um, but some of it is it's more suitable for agriculture. And uh, the spots in the landscape that we're seeing the fields are, are indicative of that. Uh, these are alpha sol soils. And so they're slightly heavier, but you can think that they're kind of sandy. And there's also this ebbing and flowing across the landscape. Um, and then the, uh, there's this kind of rolling uh, topography. And you can think the original land cover was kind of maple, oak, and basswood forest. And so, Lastly, we'll talk about Bigelow. And so I'm from southwest Minnesota, so I, you know, Bigelow is like my favorite. My brother lo lives like six miles north of here. And um, you'll notice that the, the, the parcelization looks slightly different. Again, some of that has to do with, uh, with the timing of the photograph, but it's also because the fields are typically a little bit larger in southwest Minnesota currently. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with it's, it's a flatter landscape. And it's a landscape with heavy and rich soils. And um, as many of you know, it, it's, lended, it's, it's uh, lent itself to corn and soybean production um, extensively currently. Um, and so uh, originally it was tall grass prairie. Um, and again, you can see we have um, our lake there. 
So and now I'm going to pass it back to Yvonne, and he's going to talk about uh, the population uh, patterns throughout. Okay. Um, so in a lot of ways, these uh, townships, although we've selected them uh, on the criteria of uh, having remnant forest, having 20% Swedes, uh, they're in some ways pretty typical frontier towns uh, for the era uh, in Minnesota. So they, uh, the, the only one that is established by, by 1880 uh, is Bigelow. You can see that the other two are a little more recently settled, but Balcom grows very quickly uh, in, the, uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and this is pretty typical of the of the rate that we saw uh, in the counties. So these are towns which are growing along with the counties uh, in which they are uh, located. Um, if we flip back actually to uh, the, the other sort of interesting social context with Kenosha, um, does anyone want to hazard a guess about what that thing in the lower right corner here in Kenosha is? Looks like a swimming pool. Um, it's not a very safe swimming pool. It's actually Duluth Airport, um, and so uh, Kenosha is located like very close. I mean, Duluth Airport is a little ways out of town, uh, but this is located very close uh, to Duluth, and you can sort of see by 1940 uh, that some of the occupational mix of Kenosha is it's sort of exurban Duluth um, if, for people who are able to drive and uh, work in uh, activities that are probably more likely to be related uh, to uh, to Duluth rather than to sort of Kenosha as an independent. Uh, uh, setting for, for, for different things. Um, so as I say, fairly typical frontier towns, they grow fairly, uh, fairly rapidly, uh, early 20th century, declining household size uh, in, the, in the early 20th century. One of the things we're able to do, we've got several hundred uh, people here, is look at who stays here. Uh, and again, these are towns that are fairly, uh, fairly typical uh, of the experience uh, of, of towns in this era, a high degree of circulation. So let me explain uh, this, uh, this graph. Uh, any, we've got uh, across the sort of the four censuses that we, we looked at, 1910 uh, through uh, through 40, uh, <coughs> we can tell whether people are there in, in each of those years, uh, and so we can look at uh, look at persistence. Um, and so at any uh, any one point in time, the sort of the height of the red bars here is like the, the total the total number of households, and we're looking just at household heads. Uh, so here in 1910. Uh, is all of the, the people who were, all of the household heads, uh, about a couple of hundred uh, household heads uh, in Borkholm uh, in 1910. And then we can look and see, um, there's, a, there's a, you know, a few problems identifying, like, is that the same Frank Johnson? Uh, but by, and there were a lot of Johnsons, of course, because we're selecting a town to have a lot of Johnsons and Andersons. Um, but we were able to determine uh, pretty, pretty easily, like, these are the same people, they've got the same spouse, same, uh, same birthplaces, um, born in the same year. Pretty easy when you're dealing with a limited set. Uh, and so you can see that uh, <coughs> down here, this is the number of people then who are we see we locate ten years later, uh, and it's less than half, well under, well under half. And then going forward to 19, 1930, this is out of this initial set. There's even fewer. And so this this bar here is the number of people who sort of persisted 1910, 20, 30, 40. Uh, and so you have a high degree of uh, high degree of circulation. Uh, these are the people who are sort of newly ha established household heads in the town uh, in 19, 1920, and we can do the same thing. Like, what is the proportion of that? Uh, of this is a of, of that to see what is the persistence through to the through to the next decade. Um, if you're thinking, this is kind of hard to interpret, it's because there's a lot of mobility. This is really uh, illustrating that there's a lot of <coughs> circulation uh, through these places. Perhaps an easier way to see it is, um, you know, just how many people do we find uh, ten, 10 years later? Uh, in Bigelow, we've got a little bit of an issue in that the, the, there's an incorporation of the village um, at some point, and so uh, we just need to determine where, where people actually are. But very similar uh, across all of these. About, uh, only about 30 to 40 percent uh, of household heads are locatable uh, in the same township uh, 10 years later. Uh, and so a lot of these people are, are, are moving the household structure uh, is changing. This is very uh, much uh, what other people have found doing the same kind of thing, that 10 years later uh, in frontier towns, 
you do you find less than half of the people still there and still basically in the in the same uh, household. This uh, <coughs> overstates individual mobility because some of the uh, new household heads were people who were previously uh, wives or children uh, of the uh, men who were heading the uh, older men who were heading the households. 10 years previously, uh, but it does suggest the sort of the degree of change in the structure of the households, but also a lot of people uh, who, were, who were moving out. Uh, as we were doing this, you know, we did not see uh, a lot of these people who were sort of still there, um, you know, in another, in another capacity. Um, these are people who are, who are moving out and are, are leaving, uh, leaving the township. So a high degree of, of inflow uh, and outflow from these towns. And if we're sort of circling back to the, to the earthworms, who are really uh, the things we're interested in is the population of earthworms, not people. Um, more and more people can bring the earthworms, and those people moving out can take them elsewhere, probably accidentally, unless they had a kind of a collection going on. Um, but the point is, mobility is sort of central to this migration uh, of, uh, uh, of earthworms. Um, and there is uh, a lot of that uh, going on uh, in these places uh, at, the, uh, at the time. Um, <clears throat> Just to sort of briefly give a sort of how do the how do the what do these places look like in relation to the counties of which they're uh, a part? Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the sort of changing proportion of the population uh, in agriculture, uh, rem remembering that Kenosha is sort of up here in the top right, um, northeastern Minnesota, Borkholm in the in the centre, uh, and then Bigelow uh, <clears throat> down uh, bottom uh, bottom left. Um, and so you can see this, <coughs> that uh, there's Kenosha is sort of typical of its area. It's not a great place for agriculture, and relatively few people uh, are working uh, in agriculture. <coughs> Bullcombe, Bigelow, they're of a piece with their surrounding counties. Uh, a lot of the population uh, engaged in agriculture uh, over, uh, over the early 20th century, and not a, not a huge amount of change. Uh, if we look at a sort of another vector, uh, people who are engaged in forestry and wood processing, this is very regionally concentrated uh, up in uh, nor northern and northeastern Minnesota. Uh, and the locations in which you see more people sort of shift around uh, over time. Um, and <coughs> it's not always uh, around, around Kenosha. So this is a sort of not a permanent industry is the thing to take away uh, from, uh, from this. It's, Agriculture persists, but logging tends to be for a couple of decades, and then and then it's done uh, at the uh, at the most. Uh, and so, it's just back to you now. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. So, <laughs> the ultimate goal is to link yeah. the spatial data uh, to the population data, um, so we can get a picture of the people in the specific place, and that's a, that's a work in progress currently. Um, and so, the, also, agriculture serves as this critical interface between the population and, uh, and, and the environment at, uh, to mediate earthworm dispersal in the southern two townships, but not maybe as much in Kenosha. Um, now we're going to move a little bit into um, seeing how land use actually changes over time and what our, our progress has been on that part of the project. And so, we, um, we've been using the historical imagery uh, from the Minnesota Historical Area Photographs Online. Uh, who, who in here is familiar with this resource? Yes, okay. <laughs> We've got two. Geographers, okay. Uh, so the Borchert Map Library is, uh, is where, where this is housed. And it, it's actually uh, a wonderful resource where we have imagery going back to the 30s. And so let's say you're, you're working on a specific geography and, um, and you go, hey, I, I wonder what was actually going on there um, on, on the landscape. And you can pull up, uh, they're just JPEG images. Um, and so what we did was we stitched together all the images for the township and then geo-referenced them in QGIS. This is a typical GIS workflow. Um, and then we moved into the land cover classification phase. And so this is where things are slightly different from a, a traditional, uh, a, a traditional uh, GIS approach. Um, We'll go through the classes here in a little bit. And so we have imagery, um, 1930s, uh, and then 1960s pre post, so we can get this snapshot. Um, and then Kenosha is the only one that we have imagery throughout, because the record is a little bit spotty. But what we're going to get here is a little bit of, is, is a kind of a, a broad brush picture of how, that, how the land use has been changing through this imagery. 
Um, and so what we ended up doing, because you can think this is a single band 8-bit uh, imagery that it's, we can go through and we can hand classify. We decided to go with uh, Zooniverse, which is a citizen science website, um, uh, for, for a few reasons. One, we felt that there's potentially people in each of these places that would be interested in engaging on this project. Two, this is highly scalable. And so if we wanted to do a larger study extent, we could eventually uh, go this route and, and do like the entire state of Minnesota. Three, um, it's a good use of, uh, of PhD RA time. Um, and so um, it means that I could put my time into doing other things uh, as opposed to uh, going through and hand classifying all the imagery. Um, and so just giving you a picture of this, so we'll have you on this in a little bit actually um, to, to be looking at things. But so you can see here the image for each township gets chopped up. Um, and then there's uh, a first question, which is a simple question of, do you see agriculture here? Yes, no. I'm not so sure. It, for the individual going through, it really doesn't matter to us. There's going to be at least 15 people that look at this image. And so it's kind of the idea that if we get enough folks looking at it, we're going to get eventually something that is, is indicative when we look across all of them. Um, and so then if they say yes, they can draw rectangles for an agricultural field, or they can draw polygons. Um, and so what I get out of this, uh, out of the back end, is just a bunch of JSON. And so Use, that, uh, use Python to parse that, and then uh, combined with uh, other, other tools and kind of uh, a, the Python data uh, science stack to actually then look and see what people did here. And so here's a, uh, an example of, uh, of one image, image four, and human one and human two from Borg Home 1939. So this is kind of, I, I get a kick out of looking at this. So this is, these are the lines that people actually drew. And so you can see here, this was forest. picked up. This was for forest, right? Yeah, this yeah. is for forest, yeah. <coughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, they're drawing agriculture here. They're very skilled. Um, so they're picking up forests. That's what we're going to look at throughout. Um, so forests there, you can see that they're picking them up. This person only drew two, whereas this person drew a lot. When we look at the percentage, only 5% roughly classified as forest versus 17.8. You're going, oh no, that's such a huge, huge difference. When we merge all of them, and so this is still in process, so we'll end up having 15 per image. Um, just with six, um, we're seeing about 13% uh, or so of the image being classified as forest. And then when we go to the most, most thorough, the, the ones uh, that are classifying the most, we're seeing 14%. We'll do validation step on this, but I, I do think that this is interesting because what even compared to kind of the most thorough to the not so thorough, we're not seeing actually that big of a percent change. And it, the, the validation step will be pretty interesting. Note the range though, two and a half percent to 17.8 percent. So we can look at another image where, there, where folks are also classifying for us. And so this is person one, person two. So we're seeing some differences. Here, but in general, these two are getting about the same. Here, this person only got some of the big chunks, and they're missing out on the littler ones. And then we have someone that goes in and is drawing in even little ones. And we can go through, we can see all this. And so on average, we're getting about 24% classified as forced in this image, uh, with a range of 17.9, uh, to 31%. When we put them all together, it looks something like that. Um, this is, I, I think that this is interesting to look at. Um, obviously, we need to validate it. So if we look at where we're at in the process of classification, um, so one classification has been done for six images. On, set, on nine of our images, we've had two classifications done. Seven, three, so up here, two, seven classifications done. And so we still have quite a ways to go um, just on Borg Home Forest. And so that's a very small subset of the total. And so we have 95 total classifications a day, 385 to go. Uh, these classifications came in about seven minutes at the back of uh, when, when we were in Kyung Su's class. So th this goes really quickly, which is nice. If we look at agriculture, the numbers are fewer. We have 49 classifications to date so far, 431 to go. Um, and so if we look at the total of all the classifications that we need, we have 144 image classifications to date, and we have 1,721 to go. We did about 10% of the data set, though, in about 10 minutes. So I, I think that that's exciting from a scalability standpoint. 
And so what I'd like you to do now, actually, is if you have, I see lots of laptops and iPads. Um, I, I actually think it's best to actually to look at this in person. And so y Yvonne is going to take us. Yeah. So um, I mean, just to sort of back up uh, from, from what Brian said, one of the things I think you probably would have seen as we uh, went through the um, uh, through the photos is like, why do we why are we asking smart people like you to do this rather than getting rather than having a smart person like Brian just like program this into a computer and say, okay, the really dark bits are forest, and then the slightly less dark bits those are agriculture. Um, and essentially, the problem is that it's very hard to write that program to 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 get the machine to do the correct classification. And we started out trying to do that, uh, and it really wasn't working and so we decided to do this and this I think as you can see like this is you can, I think you can see where the forests are and we've been pretty uh, pretty pleased with how people have been able to do it so if you go uh, yeah there's uh, Z uh, <laughs> I'll just say Z that's how it's said <laughs> z.umn.edu earthworms um, and open that up and we'll uh, We'll, we'll, we'll look at some forests. Okay. So, come here. We're going to do the, you know, you could look at, look at a tutorial. You've had the, you know, what is this project about part now, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, we're trying to classify basically four sets of things. Um, Forests and trees, roads, agriculture, and then human, more uh, more permanent human stuff, buildings and farmyards. But we'll, we'll do forests because uh, that's what we've been been looking at. So if you click on click on forests and trees, and you're going to get a different image. You're going to get a random image uh, behind the scenes. What's it's trying to prioritise getting through the images, but also getting um, multiple classifications uh, on uh, on each image. So answer the question. This is just breaking this down into things that are really simple. Um, if you have kids, uh, I think kids could recognize this. So if you're stuck for something to do with your kids tonight, if you have kids. Um, and kids love forests and trees. Kids love agriculture. Uh, please go home and, and do this with your family. It's a great, uh, great thing to do. Um, actually, I, I will not tell a lie. What kids really like is the animal classification projects on Zooniverse. But you know, forests are great. Um, so we're going to draw a forest. Uh, you can see that um, we, uh, for, with the forest, we went with this uh, with the polygon uh, rather than because forests don't come in rectangular-sized uh, uh, groups. So you just select and then you basically draw closely around the outline of the image. Uh, I'm making the decision here. Yours is going to look, of course, a little different. I'm sort of breaking up between these two clumps of forest because there's a. Um, there seems to me to be like a little bit of uh, a boundary between them. Now you could uh, you could decide to l lump them all together. That's totally fine. You know we're going to average this all out at the end. Um, you can uh, see. See, I was uh, screwing this up. It's very easy to reverse yourself. You can select this and say, "Okay, made a mistake," and just uh, just do it again. So. Are you all doing this? If you've got a laptop, I hope you are. It's uh, <laughs> don't just you know watch me. I know it's it's, rough it's just uh, fun like fun to watch me. Have I got all the forest, or do you think there's more forest in this picture? I think there's. Where's the forest? That little black. Block. This little this little sort of funny shaped uh, you know almost like shaped like America actually. <laughs> um, somebody was clearly growing their trees and. Probably Swedish immigrant, like you know. So this is like 1939, so it would be wise if you were an immigrant to signal how patriotic you were by. <laughs> growing. And what about this? Do you think this is a forest and trees down here? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Well, maybe. Yes. So. I'm and so your your degree of uncertainty there, that's going to be captured by these 15, you know, the 15 repetitions we get of this. Uh, various people will make different decisions on that. Some people will just be lazy and be like, I'm not going to do those trees. But there'll be some, and th those are not you. Those are people, who, you know, maybe your kids. Um, and, but across, we'll probably get something which is pretty close uh, to, to what an expert would do. So do you think I'm done? Have I got it? Have I missed any trees here? 
You think that's good. You just want to be over with this part. Don't you? <laughs> okay. Um, so then we just confirm, like, you know, we, are you really sure? And then we're done. Um, and essentially, we're going to repeat this for all of the images, uh, for all of the um, uh, for all of the townships, and across all of the different uh, the different activities, uh, and then synthesize it. Um, and as Brian was saying, this has been this we started. I mean, I am involved in, in Zooniverse with it with another project, and I thought, well, we might as well give this a whirl because like the computer classification was not working, um, and we've been pretty encouraged at how pretty untrained people are able to recognize forests and trees and agriculture. So um, buildings, I think, will actually be maybe a little more more challenging because um, they sometimes, it's hard to tell, like, what is that thing? Um, so, so that's how we're going to do it. If you'd like to continue, we'll just, no, we will not wrap up. Um, <laughs> we will... Uh, <laughs> move on uh, to where are where are what is the yeah you're coming back yeah <laughs> we will move on to what we're going to do once we once you have helped us with our work okay there you go so by this point you may ask. Isn't it too much to do about ursums? <laughs> 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 but I can tell you that, uh, and I, I'd like to remind you that uh, the ecological impacts of the invasive ursums in the Minnesota vegetation and biogeochemistry are actually even surprising to us who have been seeing many of the changes in the ecosystems uh, by human activities. So there are also concerns that, uh, that at least at the regional and local scales, uh, the impact of the uh, invasive organisms might be larger than the impact of climate changes, at least even the Great Lakes uh, regions and New England. So uh, it's actually quite important for us to understand how the organisms have been you know, populating this formerly uh, graciated you know, vegetation, uh, vegetated areas, and also how our actions and our, our movement will affect their uh, future uh, populations uh, in this part of the world. So let me, uh, you know, we'd like to finish our talk by just letting you know a little bit more about you know, where we stand and what we are going to do uh, next. So this is a kind of rough summary of what Brian and Evan have covered. So at the beginning of our uh, work, uh, we, we spent most of the time in identifying those three townships uh, in different uh, eco, uh, eco regions in, uh, in Minnesota. And then once we uh, you know, found and identified those uh, townships, then the second thing we did uh, was to, you know, down in twofold, one is to look at uh, their kind of land use types and how their land use histories uh, have been uh, different uh, by the biomes that they are settled. And the second part was looking at uh, the population changes in these uh, three towns. And if you look at those uh, you know, three you know, places in the Canosia and Bogholm and Bigelow, and you know, just by having them side by side, you can tell that uh, their land uses are actually quite uh, distinct. So for example, Bogholm, which is covered by deciduous forest and with you know, agriculture in you know, a productive soils, but still have significant uh, topography and ups and downs. And then and that has the most diverse and complex uh, land uses. So we are currently working into uh, you know, uh, looking at their uh, you know, land uses more carefully. And then you just participated in one of this effort you know, by asking people to uh, delineate the land uses. And then also, you know, once you create those uh, polygons, and those polygons will eventually convert it to the areas of specific land uses and also the, the length of their uh, you know, boundaries, edges, which will tell us you know, how much area, you know, how much length of the porous, 
uh, John exists, you know, that allowed ocean invasion from the human uh, affected areas to the forest. And also, uh, eventually, we also like to uh, look at how how the population changes uh, in these uh, three townships can be uh, linked to the land use changes on those uh, three uh, you know, townships. So that's where we are going. And then eventually, then you know, once we go through this, then this will give us uh, a quite a good background to sample orsons and then kind of link those you know uh, orson populations we are going to find in the field to you know, what humans have done to the landscapes uh, by populating them and also by in deciding on the land use patterns within this uh, ecosystems. And like that, and we'd like to uh, finish our talk. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, questions. <laughs> questions or comments? Yes. Hi. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. Uh, I didn't, I don't really have, feel like I have an understanding of what the invasion of earthworms is going to do to the forest. There was that one very scary yes. slide, yeah. <laughs> but I don't have a sense mm -hmm. about really what the, impl mm -hmm. the long term implications mm -hmm. are for the forest or for crops or mm -hmm. for prairies. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could say yes. a little more? Yeah. So, uh, so one of my field sites is in, uh, near uh, the Leech Lake, which is kind of north central of Minnesota. And then it's a deciduous forest. And if you enter the forest, you will first see many basswood and then uh, sugar maples. And then um, so if, you, uh, if you're familiar with kind of pre ocean invasion uh, forest, then you will expect to walk on a very soft ground because there is about you know, five to, to centi centimeter thick uh, you know, leaf layer. So you will be working on the very you know, soft and you're hearing uh, you know, this cracking sound of the dry leaves. But then after you walk through this area a little bit, then you suddenly you know, find yourself you know, stepping on hard ground, no leaf layer. So that's where you entered, that's where you entered, also invaded the forest. So there's a dramatic change. And this is very important because uh, the leaf layer you have is the layer that young seedlings use as a protective layer. So if you don't have this little layer, those young seedlings will be easily identified by deer and they will be browsed. And also they will have less likelihood of surviving on the winter time too. And second, uh, you know, that's the kind of cover. Uh, but if you look into the soil, and, and then um, you are going to find that the decomposition processes of organic matter, which kind of furnish the uh, nutrients to the trees, is dramatically altered by the arsons. And for example, once you lose the little layer, then you also lose the, in the root zone of the in a fine roots that sustain those uh, understory plants. So those understory plants will go away, and then also fungi will go away too because they need high organic matter. But then your decomposition will be driven, begin to be driven by the microbes instead of the fungi, which has very different uh, types of nutrient cycling. So there's a whole suite of changes going uh, along with also invasion. And so there's also impact on some of the native species like a songbird and the salamanders uh, because they actually need this leaf layer as the habitat. Once this leaf layer is gone, they no longer have those habitats. So they was, oh, the earth related effect have kind of cascading ecological consequences. Yeah. Jensen, what's it do to the carbon storage potential for a forest? So uh, the earthworms also uh, dramatically changed um, the carbon that can be stored in the soils. So uh, in, in, in the area uh, in uh, Minnesota, uh, you often uh, see the reduction of the soil carbon you know, associated with earthworm invasion. But then that part is somewhat variable depending on you know, what, uh, you know, what vegetation system you examine. So uh, we, I have another site in northern Sweden. Uh, it's very different from Minnesota, and that's the Arctic. And then there, earthworms began to arrive. 
and then in, at that part, in that part of the world, we actually see a dramatic reduction of the carbon in the soils. Yeah. Scary. Mm -hmm. The Zooniverse example, so you're classifying agriculture and forests, and I'm just curious about the native prairie lands. What does, what would class, what will happen there? The, there are not many. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's, and so it's, it's not really discernible on the imagery, actually. Yeah. Um, and so it, it won't be, it won't be classified. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the land cover extent is, you know, look, looking through the images, it's just not, not really there. So is that so then sort of that expert knowledge will be used to better identify where those places are for Yeah. Time, yeah. And so there's there's like one small patch there and we know we know where that is. Um, and so <laughs> we, we won't have we won't have people go through, you know, hundreds of images mm -hmm. to say to say no. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, Ryan, uh, I was thinking maybe how about if you could uh, for instance, first use uh, automatic uh, classification to find like darkness and uh, lightness areas mm -hmm. in the image, mm -hmm. and have people evaluate those as far as mm -hmm. or other ones instead of having them draw a line between. So them. that that would be definitely better. It, so interfacing with the Zooniverse uh, site is a little challenging, mm -hmm. oh. um, and so it's it's kind of a pre-cooked, you know, like platform, and so mm -hmm. the development time needed. You know, in order to, to do that would be higher, um, and so. But but I agree, like that would be definitely like a, a better solution. Um, we did do we, we tried various automated you know supervised and unsupervised classification methods, and you know it just there's just not a lot of you know you, you think about the number of features that you can get, um, and so at the pixel level at the you know for pixel based classification techniques there's just you have that one eight bit you know number. For, um, we also use super pixel, you know, based classification, so object based uh, classification techniques. And so you can derive more features, um, you can get after texture and whatnot. And it, I, I was not able to get it to perform all. So I also admit, I took remote sensing like long enough ago that um, I, had, I was teaching myself. Now I, you know, I consulted with experts, I was consulting with people lab. What I didn't do, and I would really love to do, is use some of the new uh, deep learning methods, particularly ComNets. Um, there's been some success in use spatial lately with those. Um, development time on getting those up and running is looks pretty substantial. Until someone else in the office figures it out, I'm going to wait. So, <laughs> one of the f funny things they've found with sort of designing citizen science websites is if you have tasks like that, where you're essentially asking people to confirm something, say yes, no, is the people get pretty lazy? Um, and if you think about it. You know what we're engaging people with with citizen science is like making you feel like you're making the discovery and that you're making an active contribution. And when you give people a task, um, which is like, yeah, just you know, tell me if the computer's right or wrong, and it's presented like that, those projects when they've given people ha have not had a lot of engagement on a sustained way. And so, when you can think about give it, structuring the task in a way that at least makes the the citizens feel they are really active participants and in this case you know you are like we don't have the classification but that we're behind the scenes um, that tends to lead to better engagement even though you know some level it's just like yeah you're just drawing boxes but people find that more engaging than uh, yes that's a forest that's dark you know it's I mean and you can sort of see like you know you fill out an online survey and you just get kind of lazy like yeah like yes, down the line with things. Whereas this makes you actively engage. Like, okay, I've got to draw that forest there. It'd be interesting actually to do a direct one-to-one -one comparison. So yeah. we talked about a methods methods yeah. paper with this, and that that, that, would, be that would be excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that'd be excellent. Um, another question that I have is, um, um, how do you want to link these classifications to population changes? Like uh, eventually, we will. One of the is so we're just sort of stepping down into exploring these townships. The, 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 the places don't get addresses in the census until, until later, and so we're, we know we're going to have to sort of go to the, the next stage and go to directories or, or something um, to like tie the, the land use to the population data. Um, but we've, what we've got for now is sort of pretty, pretty aggregated within the township. And even where they do have addresses, um, 
it's sometimes, and this, you know, these are rural areas, it's like their, their address is listed as they're on this road. So, yeah, it's going to be hard, we think, to put them more specifically, like this family mm -hmm. was at this, this farm um, that corresponds to this known place on the map in 1939. So, uh, so is there anything that can be done about this thread? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Clean, clean your boat off. <laughs> or you can take it somewhere. I mean, are we too far gone? Yeah. It's really hard to eradicate or some ones they are within the once they are you know introduced so I think the best practice is not to introduce them to begin with but then unfortunately I don't think uh, you know we are winning the war at least within the Great Lakes region so you know uh, based you know, in one site that uh, I'm working on we actually have earth in Beijing gradient and, but then, um, you know, three years ago, I discovered that, that uh, there is another invasion front coming off from the opposite direction, so they finally emerged. So, <laughs> and, and also, uh, you know, Lee Frehley, who should be here today, and he also had a quite extensive uh, survey of ursums in the boundary water uh, wilderness. And his mapping of Ursums uh, you know, also showed that uh, almost all of the campgrounds and then uh, <coughs> police, uh, you know, routes have been already invaded by the Ursums and that they are actually uh, moving into the remaining areas. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a difficult <laughs> problem to have. But I believe uh, that, you know, I was talking a little bit about uh, the northern Sweden a little bit uh, earlier. Um, and within the northern Sweden, there is still enough time to actually uh, stop the Ursum invasion because it's very remote. And then also Ursum invasion uh, started very recently. And also, uh, also because there are very, you know, uh, uh, specific routes that uh, people arrive on those in you know, Arctic landscapes. So uh, we we actually just published one paper in the biological invasion, kind of requesting some immediate action uh, to uh, regulate uh, the introduction of ursums in those Arctic uh, landscapes. Can't just like drive metal sheets down in the ground to stop them from <laughs> 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 how, far, how far down to earth uh, So th that's actually quite an interesting question because uh, <laughs> because uh, you know when I read the literature, um, there are actually reported that uh, you know specific organisms like Rumbricus terrestris that that make a uh, deep uh, vertical burrow. And then they were found to the depths of one meter to two meter. So when I began to walk in Minnesota, I assumed that you know this is cold place, so those ursums will probably go down quite deep and then hibernate uh, through the winter. So when I was digging my first soil pit in the highly ursum invaded area, I was expecting to see quite perturbed soils by ursums in deep you know deep uh, depths. But I actually found uh, ursums are very much concentrated in a top 20 centimeter. So, uh, you know, what I, so Lee, Lee Frehley's interpretation is that uh, in Minnesota you have a thick uh, snow, and the snow actually insulates uh, soils very effectively. So one of the data, you know, you, you can see is, you know, uh, you know, several years ago we had a very warm winter, uh, and then we didn't have the snow pack. But the soil was actually colder than the previous colder years because at that time we had enough snow that uh, insulated the soils. So it looks like uh, in, in Minnesota, and if you have you know, good uh, snow uh, cover, then ursums can hibernate the winter without having to go in you know, quite significant depths. And then they survive uh, in the boundary water too, and even in the relatively rocky uh, landscapes. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're kind of your you know, you know, worst nightmare. <laughs> the Swedes have survived as well. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and go ahead and yeah. classify for us. Please. <laughs>